Show with your host, Monty Clark. We stand together and accept that we now live in a world transformed by Fukushima. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time here on UCY.TV Radio. We relentlessly engage every ear that listens. We expose and confront the complete lack of accountability for the nuclear industry. Consider social engineering programs who view our bodies, minds, and souls as assets on a balance sheet. We discuss vital current issues, interview activists, and engage our audience in an effort to allow all voices to be heard. The Age of Vision Radio Show creates a venue that all will choose. We encourage our listeners to reclaim their power and their courage to take action and save our planet from the ravages of greed and indifference. Our actions matter. Every voice matters. We remind our listeners that happiness is resistance. Love is greater than fear. Good morning, UCY.TV radio listeners. This You're listening to Lonnie Clark with the Age of Fission radio show. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate you tuning in to us and being willing to get informed about uh, issues and ideas that will transform our planet and hopefully save our planet. Uh, as most of you know, we are being assaulted. I hope you enjoyed Friday's rerun of Don Chapman's interview. I was able to escape to the Cascadia National Park and go camping where there was no internet, no nothing there. It was really great to be unplugged for a few days. So thank you for that, and I hope you enjoyed the rerun of Dawn on Friday. Today is Monday, and it's usually the day I interview activists from St. Louis, and I'm very excited to have back Scotty with Scotty's contract out of St. Louis. He is a, really a contractor who has come up with a brilliant idea of a phytoremediation. So, Scott, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate your time here. Thank you, Lonnie, and everybody at um, UCYTV for having me on again. Um, I look forward to this, and I've been looking forward to this for a long time since we talked last. Oh, good, 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 because you've been putting a lot of things in order. Um, Why don't you give our listeners kind of the general rundown of what your... Uh, process is because Scotty's come up with an idea of, and he's actually working with the EPA and following guidelines to help remediate the soil at the Westlake landfill and, uh, and frankly, any nucleated area or poisoned area. So why don't you explain to them what how your process works? Our process works by um, incorporating electrokin- electrokinetic, which is um, sending low-level um, ele- electric current through the soil to get the heavy metal soil toxins moving and directed to an area where plants suck these toxins out of the ground and into the plant. After the plant absorbs these toxins, they then go into a digester with um, some pro- proprietary stuff but the end result is we have heavy metal toxins that are not toxic to humans um, in a matter of days. Wow. Wow. And then what happens with the plants after that? They go into the diet. Um, it depends. What, um, in the pilot study, we have plan coming up. Um, the plant, the plant material may be able to be reused. Um, I'm not, that's, that's a hope, um, but that will be determined by what the um, radiation levels or what is just, that'll, that's to be determined. 
That's right, just what depending I on what you find. So tell us a little bit about your 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 study, your plan that you're going to do, that you're going to conduct. What what does uh, that entail? I'm going to try for another grant, um, DEP, or through the through the federal government um, that pertains to what we're going to be studying and and the science behind the, the everything. Mm -hmm. And how long will it be conducted for the study? Um, it's suggested by the rules and regulations um, that govern the FICO remediation that one to three year studies are suggested. Okay. So are you going to study it for one year and then continue, or are you going to just plan yes, on doing a three year study? Well, I'm planning on a three year study off the bat with. Um, quarterly and yearly reporting and updates and progress. Uh -huh. And so what, is the pl what does the study entail? Like, are you going to use people's houses and their yards? Or are you going to just go out to a section of the landfill? Or what does it actually entail when you say you're going to conduct a three-year study? What, can you give, give us a synopsis of what would happen to whatever area or how you're going to determine the area? What, what's going to happen? There's a few options, but um, basically we would uh, um, construct, a, um, construct a greenhouse and then set up an electrical field in the, in the yard. And this is geared for to help people in their yards, remove the toxins to, out of their yards. Um, I can't, they're not... They probably are not going to let me work on the landfill and help there. So I, okay. I've redirected my efforts to actually helping the people um, remove the toxins from the yard, which I fear are going to be ignored by the um, their existing rules and guidelines or whatever. Mm hmm. So you'll get a na one neighbor, two neighbors, three neighbors near there to participate, or how many people would participate with the program? Um, I'm hoping up to four or five. Okay. It depends on how big people's yards are. Okay. Um, so you put a greenhouse in between these yards, essentially? Like um, in their backyards, where the backyards right, kind right, of can join? Right, right. Um, most a lot of places um they have like right backyards border each other side yeah. yards border each other you know just to keep the cost as low as we can we need to um use the least amount of greenhouses as as we can mm -hmm. to keep the overall cost for for the the homeowners and so what's um, the point of having the greenhouse what's the what's the point the green, of the greenhouse the greenhouse allows for plants to be grown all year long, and it also, um, we could um, incorporate plants that may not be conductive to this growing area. Okay. Um, and then, but um, by, we can grow like, um, like there's a, a radish, for example, that's a big phyto, has big phyto abilities. It would be a good winter season crop to grow. Okay. Where, where, um, like, say, canaf would be a, a spring, summer season um, plant to grow. Oh, I see. So you'll grow different types of plants according to how they grow in that, in that at temperature and at right. that temperature. The, like radishes. So you're saying that radishes actually absorb radiation? Is that that's... Um, the type of radish that I'm thinking of, yes, it will. Wow. Wow. There's, okay, so then we grow and you grow it in the greenhouse. Now when you're growing this in the greenhouse, does it make that inside structure of the greenhouse more radiated since it's attracting the radiation to it? With the I electromagnetic. Would have, I would have to assume yes. Huh. Huh. And, okay. and that's the and that's the other reason for the greenhouse is is uh, we are containing and confining the radiation that may be present. Mm. So that would be coming up up through the air and the soil. And then once those things, so through the season, now who, 
there's a lot of questions I have about this. I hope you don't mind me keep bombarding it's you with fine. questions. No, this is fine. Um, this is fine. Once the greenhouse is built, the plants are growing. Who may you guys will your firm or your organization will maintain the greenhouses, like the growth, the watering, the tending? Because all that stuff needs to be tending, right? So it has to be tended. So, um, yes, yes. I there. Besides having a, like a, a camera system monitoring, uh, there's 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 other options. Um, just out of curiosity's sake, I'm going to want to look at them once a week. Okay. Just for, just, I mean, it's not something that, um, and also after the pilot study, our goal is to teach other people how to do this. The pilot study is for us to streamline our system. We are combining five other proven ways to remediate into one, into one system. Mm. Wow. <clears throat> Has this ever been tried before? Has anybody ever done this before successfully? Each, each 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 one of the systems we're combining has been done successfully before, yes. Okay. But not not all together. So you're combining what are the systems that you're combining? Um electrokinetics, phytoremediation, oil remediation, um Electrokinetics, bioremediation, and then um, toxic eating microfungi. Wow! So you guys, you you've actually found a a, a fungi that will actually eat the toxins. Yes, we have. Wow. Okay. So now let's. So I don't jump the uh, put the cart before the horse. So we're growing the plants. You're maintaining them. The let's say you plant them in the summer. At the end of the summer, it fall comes they're full of whatever it is it's a successful thing you go in you're going to pull those plants out and then replant other plants that will grow through the winter right? correct. correct and then with the plants that you've pulled out what happens to those they go in sealed tanks where those toxic eating microfungi go to work and and while they're working this is what's really cool about these things while they're working when they attack a toxin, they create electricity. That electricity can be funneled into batteries, into the grid, to power the home, you know. Mm. So that's that's what's really cool. So there might actually be some energy, some electricity generated with the phytoremediation process. Correct. And will it be able to be stored up? Like, it, like will it be it's, running into a battery so that? Because this is obviously an extremely long-term program, right? No, this is. It'll once they go to work, they start. Once they start attacking, that's their food source. It makes it makes the microbes happy. They make it. They make a little bowl of energy. You know, okay. you got you got a million of them things working. So you got a little million volts of energy. It all add up to be bigger bolts. So the idea is that you, do, that with this phytoremediation, and you're going to put up greenhouses, grow these plants that absorb radiation and other toxics, not just radiation. It's the other Correct. toxins also. And then you take the plants that have absorbed the toxins, put them into another like cistern or some other container. Correct. And then there's a process that's going to, you're going to add something to that process, and it's going to break down, and while it's composting, essentially, because that's what happens, plants compost, right? It'll compost, but it'll generate electricity. It'll pull off the electricity and store it into a battery. Or we can put it back into the grid, or the person can use it. Wow. Or it can be, or it can be used on site. You know, there, there's the option of, creating daylight hours and wow. to grow in, to grow to make in a semi tropic area. Wow. Wow. That's really exciting. That's a very I I mean it, are you the first company that's actually thought of this? Are there other competitors out there doing kind of similar but different? Or, I mean it, I haven't heard of anybody else doing this. Um I don't 
probably I I don't I don't know. Uh, uh-huh. I don't I yeah I don't know. Okay, so this is kind of exciting, and so then once it so as long as this landfill has not been remediated or or even actually the whole the whole plane site this could actually take off and because we're not just talking about radiation are we with this remediates any other kind of toxins so this could be something that could be shared throughout the country at any other toxic site that is that is our end goal um wow lead you know flynn had the lead crisis and what's what's the system we're developing um works in both water and soil Wow. So this is this is a natural organic way to remove toxins, heavy metals from the soil and water. And the the far reaching applications of this are the reason why I have a hard time sleeping at night. Wow. Because this could really do help people out there. Wow. This really could help people out there. So once we go through a cycle, um, when people, ha- let's say this, when, where you're going to do your, how long are you going to conduct your study? I'm sorry, for how long do you conduct your um, study? We're planning for a three-year study. Okay. So after, let's say the first year, you've got the the plants growing and you've recycled them you're just going to keep growing plants now are you going to be tracking the levels of radiation in the plants as you pull them out is that part of the study yes. like determining yes. what kind of chemicals do you have to like send it to a well, lab what is, you get what it is determined it, there's um scientific data is a little lacking i felt in my research where if you start with um say um, X amount of your your land is is poisoned with X amount. Um, how much are we going to get out? I felt I felt that in in lots of the studies I read that the data was lacking on on the amount of actual toxins removed. Well, what do you mean the amount of toxins? They they would say that they removed toxins, but they wouldn't determine how many toxins they removed? Or how much, because they were, this is all scientific stuff, and so they were only focused on one area, Um, you know, like say, without one of the things we did that, okay, the, the reason I've combined four or five things that work together is because when I researched just one of them, they said it left toxins, okay? Uh, this other one left toxins. This other one left toxins. And then it talks about why they leave toxins. Okay, well, well, I put, figured it out. I And and I um, said, well, to stop this, we do this. To stop this, we do this. And so I just designed my system around correcting all the other faults in the in the studies that I read. Hmm. Did that so, make sense? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because the studies I mean, that's kind of the the downside to where to how scientific studies are conducted in modern sciences. They disallow everything else and they don't take into consideration the influence some things may have on a net result because they're too focused on the one. It's it's how they study, no. you know. That's, that's how that's, that's how they're supposed to work. If we set out, it's fine to study them other, to learn about them other things, but if we set out to just learn about one thing, that's all we're studying. Okay. And you make and, side notes about the other right, effects. Right, right. And oh, so here's what, other here's people can learned. follow up. Right, right, right. It's the science sharing of the scientific information. Okay, okay. And, and my stuff will not be behind a damn paywall. Okay. <laughs> when okay. we're all done. <laughs> okay, good. Well, we hope that's true. We hope that you can control it like that. We hope that's true. So let's take this through this. So at the end of year two, what do you... Okay, what okay, do, okay. I want, to, I want to back up to year one. Okay. Half, halfway through that 
before we completely harvest everything at the end of the year, um, some plants will allow you to cut cut them back. That like like remove some of that toxic vegetation. So halfway and what and that will encourage the next half of the plant to cycle harder. Okay. It's the same way when you cut back your house plants, they come they come back fuller. Okay. And so we're going to be doing that as well. So halfway through that growing season, we can we can cycle some foliage off those plants. So at the sixth month, or you know, halfway through a growing season, um, we can be cycling toxins. Wow! So you can actually within the first year start yeah, within speaking. the first year. I'll have halfway results, on uh, quarterly quarter quarterly results on on microbes move or the what's going on in out in the yard. And then what's going on in the greenhouse, what's going on in the plants, and then um, halfway through the season, I'll have a half harvest information, and then I'll have a full harvest information at the end of the year. But that's for each growing cycle. Hmm. So this it sounds to me, Scotty, that part of what will happen is this is going to expose if the environment is in a continual state of uh, being polluted. Because in theory, correct me if I'm wrong, you put this the greenhouse up and say a house with in between three houses or four houses. And you're growing these in an area where it supposedly has already been remediated. The, the radiation has been taken away. We know there's residual in the ground. So this is the ideal where we come in and we get the soil remediated. But if after, say, two or three years, the soil still shows levels, high levels of toxins, it means that it is that the toxins are still continuing to pour in i mean part of the reason that generates this question is a lot of people in st louis had no idea they were being poisoned and a lot of people around our country don't realize how much these people are the the, the polluters are just without regard and with the sanctions of our local governments they're turning a blind eye and we're being polluted in levels that we're not even aware of so in theory, once you set up a greenhouse, the area should be clean of toxins, correct, after a few short years? As long as they, it does not get continually to get polluted by the landfill, yes, or, the, or a source. Um, we've, I've designed a fail-safe, or a, what, what they call it, a fail-safe in there, to where I'll know what new toxins get introduced. There will be a barrier in between what's going on in the study and, and what's going, what's coming in, like, say, through the air, through the rain or whatever. So you'll be able to see if there's new toxins coming in. Like, after you've put this up, say, in a year and a half, if there's a new element or a new type of toxin, what if they continue to um, pollute it with the, the same toxins? Like, let's say cesium-137, which is a radiation, right. uh, a, a, you know, radioactive thing. It, can you tell if that cesium-137 is new or old? Would, was there any way that you could actually tell what the levels were before or after? Do you get what I'm saying? Or is there any way to know okay. if it's been newly exposed? Um, um, they Okay, this is a little above my, uh, my forte. From my research, when the, when the nuclear radiation decays over time, there are ways they know that, that they all basically go back to lead. Um, but and then there's a couple stages before they go before they get there. I'm so that makes me think that yes, they could figure out mm. that. Wow, that would be inter <laughs> that would be a very interesting thing. Okay, so then. Let's continue with this process because I'd like to take us through the three-year study and what happens. So a year and a half in, 
you're going to cut back, and then we go into year two, you make your logs in year three, you're doing a three-year study because the EPA recommends it, correct? Correct. So at the end of your three-year study, then what's going to happen? Then what's the process then for your, we, to get this out into the public? There, there are, the options we are looking at right now is, is um, open sourcing the material, uh, offering the service for people, um, and there's one other one I, that's, um, and then philanthropy activities, activities where, okay. you know, somebody can't afford it, we will come in and, and do it. As okay, well. so the idea is to basically turn this into something that can benefit the community through uh, some type of a charitable organization, and then and then also allow it to be an offshoot, be a private industry. Because uh, in terms of private industry, this has huge implications. If if you could actually go through and remediate portions of the land. That would require, though, that we're going to see greenhouses up all over the country, right? Like big, huge. That's now, that's not a bad thing, I don't consider. I if, don't think if, so either. If we can, at the, at the end of the study, or at the end of, at the, at the end of a study, if, if I could be assured that the greenhouse did not have health risks that would endanger future people using the greenhouse, I have no problem with turning over the greenhouse. So that's that was the second part of my question. Like, okay, so let's say we get this remediated. When you go into the greenhouse, is it going to be like a radiated zone because it's attracting all this radiation, right? And toxins. Yeah, that's a fear of mine. Yes, that is. So I think I think I don't know. Maybe these plants will lock that will lock them toxins up. You know, but I fear because the electro horticulture is really going to boost things as well as the as the as the plant growth that it's going to be toxic mm. to, be de- to be determined. So that's part of what you're finding out inside the three year study is: do these plants actually emit radiation? Is it dangerous to be near them? So I imagine you guys are going to go in with uh, protective suits. gear inside the greenhouse. Yes, suits, protective gear in suits. Wow. Um, and I'm erring on the side of caution. I think all the crews will have at least two people in case something happens. Um, there's, yeah, that's another part that keeps me up at night. That's a, these are very big issues. And so then we have this, uh, these areas. I mean, that, that might be a point of contention with families because right now the radiation's in the ground. They don't have to think about it, and all they have to do is complain that the government's not helping them. But it might be some, you know, it's hard for people to admit that they have uh, toxic soil in their backyard where their kids are playing. Or, or no about toxic soil. Because I have, I'm looking at soil reports from um, two miles away from the landfill. And the foos wrap stated on the report, wind-blown contamination. Well, the only way it got there, you know, if you're two two miles away from the landfill, the only way it got there was by the wind. Yeah. Well, you know, the whole, and, but not even just, the, the, it is through the wind, but the, the air, the, the airborne radiation. So is there any way in this process, like, this is what makes me think it's going to be long term, Scotty, is that it's going to be a long term process. Like, this is going to be something that St. Louis is going to need for a good long while because of the airborne. And mostly because they haven't really fixed the issue of that smoldering event that they call it. You know what I mean? It's still going on. So this yeah. th- this is going to be a long term project, but it might end up providing the people of St. Louis a way to be able to live there. I mean, if they could decontaminate their yards, they can't con- decontaminate the air, but they could maybe decontaminate the dirt. Right? That's what you're talking about. Correct. It only decontaminates the dirt. It does not decontaminate the air. There's no way to 
do you think that electromagnetic thing will attract the radiation in the air? Not to my... The no. way to remove radiation from the air would be a filter system. Hmm, okay. Like before it came into your house. Right, like put a filter system on top of the hole on the Westlake landfill site. <laughs> like, put a filter there before, instead of just letting it blow up into the sky and the air unfiltered. A giant greenhouse, or or as as the hemp there um, says, a giant sarcophagus or something like that. I can't, that's a big word that I don't, I'm yeah. not familiar with. It ought to have something over it. I'm, I'm like, so dumbfounded that they just, like, right. it's billowing what's in the air. What's interesting um, that Hemp Nair figured out was that, um, was that you can 3D print this sarcoph sarcophagus or whatever that word is, the structure over the, over, right. over the contaminated area. And I really like that especially before they go um, opening up the ground and exposing them, all them 50,000 tons of radioactive waste to the, to the outside air. I have not heard that they plan on opening up the ground, have you? Well, they, if, they, if they remove it completely, they have to open up the ground. Uh-huh. That's why the EPA does not want to remove it because they don't want to open up the ground because they have all those other toxins in there, which they are just... They don't know what's in there. Yeah, yeah. Because they, they, this, was, this, this stuff goes back to the very first Manhattan Project stuff, and they don't... I'm sure that... The, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think they know. They, they are not opening it up out of fear of what could happen. Wow. Wow. So, uh, Scott, is there... Is there are there any other major corporations out there doing what you guys do or having any pilot projects? Are you in competition with any of the major uh, mega corporations on this pilot project of yours? I read that um, there are some major players that that have patents similar, but not but not um, what we're proposing. Hmm. Okay. So I don't. I don't feel that there will be any trouble in patenting this. Uh, if we do have trouble with patenting, we're going to open source it. We're not going to. We're not going to hide our stuff mm. behind money. Right. Right. That we is. We are. The we are. The the core. David and I's main goal from this has never been to do this as a scheme to get rich. This is strictly to help people. Yeah, that that is really the issue, is that this... And we need people to help people. I mean, this is an idea and, that... So at the end of three years, then what happens at the end of... So we're, we're, you're talking by 2020, right? Being able to submit wow. your study. Yeah, I guess I am. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds so far away, I know. <laughs> <laughs> that is where we're at, 2020. Wow. I know. Sorry to shock you there, there Scotty. <laughs> you know, I have high hopes. I, You know, I read all these other studies, and I realize they didn't. I'm going to I'm gonna kind of go out on a limb here, and I'm going to say our system, I think, will work faster than theirs because we're doing things different. Well, I certainly hope you're protecting it with patents and keeping a lid on all of it, because they will steal it from you if they can. Um, and part of me says that, man, maybe I should just tell everybody about this right now, because of the good it, the good that can come out of this. Um, I'm going in, nevertheless, um, and that's why the service industry is part, because not everybody is going to be able to be able to DIY this or wants to DIY this or we and we haven't we have DIY out, means do it your own correct right right okay. you know it's there's there's some variables here because I don't want to tell somebody they could DIY this and then and then they don't follow the, the safety procedures needed to deal around radioactive stuff and so then 
they get sick in the end, that's not helping anybody. Yeah. And I wonder if your study is going to show that it absorbs other types of chemicals that might prove to have been harmful. I mean, this is this is a very interesting study that you're planning on conducting here for the next three years because seriously, once you get this up and started, now do you have the homes identified? Do you have the area where you're going to be putting up the greenhouse yet? Are you still looking? I or? have. I have. I have. Um, Two, three people are interested. Uh, what I've never wanted to do was to, um, for my Westlake neighbors, to say, hey, I'm going to do this and not be able to follow through with it. Um, just because of what's going on, um, there there has been people that have shown interest, but I, I tell them all, um, we have to wait for pilot study funding. I don't want to get anybody's hopes up. Mm-hmm. If, if so I don't actively search for clients or places to do this with. Yeah. Um, once I get pilot study funding or or feel that I'm a for sure in, I will actively start looking for um, people I can help okay. or we can help. I get it. I get it. Because the pilot, now that's what you're talking about applying for this grant. That's what you're saying. That's what this pilot study Correct. is for. Okay. So that's the process. Get the grant, conduct the pilot study, and then conduct it for three years and see if it works, and then you can expand it to maybe help the other communities. Correct. Wow. Well, well, we're, th- this is certainly years, an optimistic gonna... point of view here, waiting three years, you know. Well, like I said, Within a year, I'm going to have tangible results. Yeah. If I lived up there right now, I would have a system going in my backyard right now, regardless of rules, regulations, whatever, I would be doing this. How far away do you live from the Westlake landfill yourself? It's a, it's a, I'm, um, it's a drive. I'm, uh, you know, if I have to stop and, get some get some groceries for the car or, or you know, gas up the car or whatever. It can take me better part of an hour to get there. So you're probably out. twenty, thirty miles away from there. Yeah, more like forty or fifty. It'd be curious. Now have you put up any type of a, a remediation site on your own property to see if there's any kind of toxins in the ground there that you may not have been told about? Um no I have not. Oh, okay. Um, Boy, I sure would be curious. I, I know well, from my own experience, that's what, because uh, I'm actually beginning to be more and more shocked at how polluted our our entire land is, our water and our land. It has just been seriously a free-for-all. They passed the Clean Water Act, and yeah, we've stopped the the, the rivers from catching on fire, but pretty much the EPA has allowed practically everything else. It's just been stunning the more I look into it. Um, sometimes they do do things really good, and sometimes I think that they missed the mark completely. Yeah, completely. And it really, I guess it has to, it depends on what, on, uh, you know, who who's paying them to ignore it, I guess. I don't know. This is the I, hard part, you know. Right. I, I, I do, I... <laughs> I don't know. I can't understand it. I know um, that whenever I'm looking into and digging into why they make their rules and stuff like that that about super funds specifically is that there are four or five big organizations involved that all seem like their their fingers are in the pie, in the nuclear pie. Hmm. Because their fingers are involved in the nuclear pile. And with billions of dollars available are geared towards the the nuclear program and and reading reading the government's future avenues of exploration, um, it looks scary. Our government is planning big nuclear stuff. 
Well, that that makes me want to ask you another question, but let me ask you my previous question. Uh, in in terms of doing this for long term, this I mean, so after three years, your plan is then what to uh, get a permit from the EPA to do this in lots of different to be a contractor with the EPA. Is that what you would be doing, or would you get one of, one of the goals is to make the EPA or not make them, to make the cleanup communities aware that there is a natural organic system that will do what they're doing cheaply. Uh huh. Um, well, that's the only thing that makes me think that it might be sabotage because these mega corporations, if they think that somebody else could be doing it in their own backyard for pretty cheap, they're going to do everything they can to squash it. They want us to pay no matter what. I, I can't, I can't change the way big corporations think. I can lead by example with with my with what we are doing. It's true. Thank you, Scotty. I I, I actually appreciate that. I, I mean, so you're saying that the government my, is the, planning. The big, here's, here's, let's talk about fun stuff. Okay, the corporation I am planning on building is going to be like the old school corporations that I heard from, I don't know, long ago. It's, I haven't heard of any for a long time. But this is going to be an actual employee-owned um, business where, where it operates like our democracy should, to where the, the smallest guy in the company has a say in, the, in how things are, are operated. Because just like me, I'm a little guy, and I come up with all this, all these big plans. Is there are other little guys like me out there that can make a difference in the world, and we got to give them a voice. But anyway, all of them. My hopes is to create an employee-owned company that people want to come work at. You know, they're going to make some make some decent money, but we're going to be helping people. Yeah. Well, this is going to be a big help, and if nothing else, it'll help people understand that there is a solution, because this would be the exciting thing, is if this phytoremediation can actually, while it's composting, really provide electricity to us, finally, from nuclear radiation, you know what I mean? Like, And all the other toxins, because it's not just the radiation it's going to be pulling out, it'll be pulling out all the other toxins, and turning it into electricity, that is the exciting, that's the... That's like, because then you're not you're not stuck with all these contaminated plants. Like right now in Fukushima, they're boxing up all this dirt over there. They have like, you right. know, that's they have mounds and mounds, I, thousands, Mount. millions of bags right. now. Right, of dirt. right, right. That's just so sitting can, there we emitting we radiation. Can, right. We can take our system, throw in some, throw in. We can right, take that dirt, dump it into a bigger pile. Go in our plants, go in our system, and we can we can make that dirt clean. Okay, and not only they make have, it clean, they but have huge they have huge tanks of water sitting over there that we could remediate. We wow. could kill the rats in that water. Wow, wouldn't that be awesome if they could actually? You know, are you telling me that our the scientists from all these mega corporations have never thought of this? This is not something they've ever considered. I don't know. I don't know why that nobody else does this. Maybe they didn't have as much time to research as I as I have. Um, uh-huh. You know, I, I don't. I can't. I don't know why. Um, I think a lot of them are are have thinking along the lines of Mr. Gates, who says that that an old nuclear waste can be an energy source in the future. Wow. You know, wow. so I don't know. I don't. I don't know why. Um, the cost to to turn it, like to incinerate it, or to do stuff like that, is so astronomical that that prohibits people from doing things as well. Wow. Well, I actually, it, it's it's there has the to wrong, be right. Go ahead. I eliminate. Another benefit of the system we developed is that we eliminate long-term storage, okay? 
that those nuclear nuclear rads that were in the plants that have now made inert, they I the one scientific study says they can just be disposed of in the landfill, in a regular landfill. They don't require long term tank storage in Nevada or wherever. So we are eliminating that, eliminating that transportation risk to the long term storage. There's there's a lot of things going on here that um, are really promising, I feel. Mm. It would be really awesome if we could move this entire process into a larger cultural change because we have, imagine what we could do thinking about this, Scotty. If, if this three-year study that you have really proves that we can actually turn the ship around, this is, this is a, something that, you know, we could really get into really changing. I mean, just thinking about putting the phytoremediation in those tanks in Fukushima. I mean, that, that alone is exciting. Because could, we could, in theory, save Japan. Because really, Japan is toast unless we figure out a way to remediate the radiation over there. Period. Lately, I've been dreaming about They say it's, it's leaking underground into the ocean. Yes, lately, it is. I've been, lately, I've been thinking about how to fix that. Good, because we need someone to figure out how to fix that, because that's why our oceans are dying. I mean, I, I saw a video this morning of an Alaskan bear with white tips on its ears and on its body, and it looks weak, and it's eating radiated salmon. I mean, Alaska, again, is among the most bombarded and hard hit with radiation in our entire country, and people are ignoring your, it. Your citizen science video you did the other day and advertised to Facebook was so spot on. You showed that there is no, there was, there is, it's, the area is void of life. That it is, was shocking. That is, um, that is citizen science reporting at the source. And that was um, stunning. It, yeah. I went out to, for the listeners who didn't see it, I uh, we and we did it on an impromptu basis. We did a Facebook Live video, mostly because we were doing videos, and Kevin Finnegan, who was with me, we went out to uh, the early tide. We wanted to go out to where the tidal, the morning... Uh, the morning and the evening, the low tide is, so we could see the marine life and, and the life in... Uh, Basically, to just make see, you know, because that's where all the little tide pools are, where the new life grows. That's where they live. And we got out there at eight thirty in the morning. At by about nine fifteen, when we started doing it live on Facebook, it was because our phones weren't working. We were in an area where the phones just were not working, and we said, "Well, let's see if we can go Facebook Live." It was the last time I was out there was about three and a half years ago. Fukushima had been going on for maybe about a year, year and a half. There were still tons of seals. Tons of that area, that little out cove where we were in, it used to, that whole big rock, it was a little area with a big rock jetting out of the ocean. That thing was covered with birds and seals the last time I was there. Now, granted, it was the middle of the day, but there should have been more birds, more seals. All we saw was one type of a green sea anemone, anemone and then that was it. We saw two starfishes two starfish among the rocks that was it two starfish and we saw three or four sand crabs that was all we saw no real life it was stunning so if I, but I, I look at what you what you're describing there I don't live next to the ocean so I, I don't have those experiences but I look at that as to be like going out in the woods here and not seeing squirrels not seeing birds not seeing, you know, the bugs that crawl around on the on the on the on the forest and stuff like that. So, yeah, I don't, I don't understand why people um, are continuing on this nuclear path that they're going. I, it just makes a little sense. To me. I think it has to do with the normalcy bias. People don't see it. Like one of the things that we were talking about yesterday driving back was the lack of birds. Like there were some birds. Yeah, we saw little tiny flocks, but nothing massive. This is the summertime. We should see lots and lots of birds up here. But it's our normalcy bias. We don't 
we it still looks beautiful out there. The ocean is magnificent. It, it's trees, the streams. I, when I went camping up in the Cascadia Park over last weekend, uh, there was very few birds. It was really kind of interesting. We should have heard a lot more birds. We'd hear two or three birds, but not massive sounds of tweet, tweet, tweet in the morning. Do you know what I mean? It's like, and it's those small things that we don't hear because of our normalcy bias. That's what I think. Those small things. Here's kind of the way I look at it. If it negatively affects the environment, it negatively affects people. Okay. What what you're describing is, is the perfect example of the canary in the coal mine. You know, where the coal miners use the little birds to let them know that that, hey, things weren't right, you know. So lack of birds is the the canary in the coal mine warning. Literally. Literally, yeah. And that's why, back to that citizen science, that's why I was reading, um, and that article was put out by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. They were like, um, citizen science reporting is needed because the scientists are overwhelmed. They can't be everywhere and do everything, and that's why um, what you did was important to somebody that's studying the effects of Fukushima. Yeah, but then we have guys like, uh, what's his name, Ken Buser from Woods Hole Oceanographic, testing the water instead of testing the fish and saying, gee, there's not very much radiation in the water. Well, there's not going to be much radiation in the water. The fish is what's really, fish magnetize the radiation by a thousand times. That's why eating fish is dangerous. We know that. That's the natural, what fish do is they see the radiation cesium-137 134 is potassium it's of that same family so they because there's so little potassium in the ocean their bodies have naturally evolved to e- magnetize potassium by a thousand times so they do the same thing to radiation so there's a thousand times more radiation in a fish that's in the water so we not just have it, this is where I get really angry with the American uh, the federal government and really with the entire scientific community. They refuse to think outside of the box that they have been shoved into. They refuse to start thinking you know if it's because it goes against their paycheck. They they don't want to tell us the truth and it is very overwhelming. I mean, it, it, we are in a point where we really need, like, what. You, this is why I'm really excited to have you on, and I hope that in a few weeks or in a month or a couple of months you'll come back again and give us an update on your process because what you're providing uh, the people of St. Louis and, frankly, the world, if it really could take off, if they don't figure out a way to sabotage you, if we, you can really get this off of the ground, this is a way that we could remediate our soil and bring our earth back to earth. Because right now we are one toxic slew. I mean, it is a very sad state of affairs to find our country and our planet in, and we need to turn the ship around which is why it's exciting that you found a simple thing that comes from the earth which will save the earth outside of anything that mankind could do. It's, it's, I call it using nature to, to solve mankind's problems. That is so awesome. So at the end of three years, you would start working with the EPA. I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, it's a three-year study, but I say in one year, I'll have enough to go global. Mm, okay. So you just need to verify that it's working, that it's going to work, right. get the system set up, and then you're conducting a three-year study to work with the EPA, but you are willing to start helping families in St. Louis remediate their backyards prior to working with the federal government. Once I know, once once the... the <coughs> Back to the safety. Once once we have things figured out to where we can teach people how to do it safely or or whatever, they there's yes, is that that's that's our goal is to put this in the hands of the people as fast as we can. Wow. Wow. Because you know how great that news not, would be. The, the the government is not going to save us. We have to save ourselves. Wow. 
Well, yeah, no, no, that is an understatement. They are not going to save us. That is for sure. They are not going to save us. But the exciting part about this is we could expand this all around the country. Like I know out here on the Northwest, the uh, Hanford Reservation, it used to be an Indian reservation, but basically since it's the same thing, the Manhattan Project Waste, it's the same stuff. They have just dumped on the Native American lands all this Manhattan Project Waste that it's... It, it, the, the whole Hanford story is it's its own issue. It's just such a horrible mess. But there are native tribes up in the Northwest that could really use this because their lands really are unusable. And their children are suffering and the people are suffering from the negative effects of radiation. So if this works, really we could get the word out and uh, people could start working on it. Even a, a DYI, there's plenty of people who could start saving their own their own processes for many people. This is an exciting, very exciting process. I think so, too. And that's one reason, like I said, I can't sleep at night, or it, I, it doesn't let me sleep at night. Um, how, do I, how do I accomplish this? Um, how to get there? Um, this is my, like I mentioned, this is my third go-around trying, trying to get a grant. Um, um, I've added, I've added, um, I've added my my I call it the core group of founders will be will will be people that have the skills and education that I am lacking mm -hmm. that will that I can present this system idea invention whatever this process to people with money that they would trust trust me essentially to um do what I'm going to say and that's kind of I've assembled a group of people that that um, we can that I feel we can do this and bring this to market and bring this to the world. That's really exciting, Scotty. Thank you. Uh, is there? Do you want to get? Do, you, do people have a contact address or any way? Do you have a website or something in case um, people want to get in touch with you? Um, I have a few websites out there. I I um, I have the Mo Hemp Energy um, website. Mohempenergy.com. Um, it, it's dot org. They all okay. should. They any Mohemp Energy should direct you to the blog. Okay. Or, or I've tried in my SEO fumblings, and then I. That was where I was keeping some of the earlier information I, I've compiled. Since then, since I figured out figured things out, we moved um, the entity to its own little domain name or whatever and it's called electro electro hemp um electro hemp god bless it i should know that that's all right electro, don't worry electro hemp.org electro hemp.org okay right. well look we have about 30 seconds left i really appreciate your time here and going through this with us i cannot tell you how grateful i am that you've actually come up with a system that gives us hope and gives us an, an idea that maybe we can really turn this ship around on a large scale because we definitely need it i really appreciate you being here scotty thank you so much and thank you for your efforts for everything um, you're doing for our planet it's my pleasure. I live here too, and I and I realize a healthy environment is needed. And that's, Amen to that. You know. <laughs> well, put your courage feet on, everybody. Take some action. Do what you can do. And thanks, Scotty. We'll talk to you guys soon. Gibson.